Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Jared Isaacman. You probably remember him from the Inspiration4 mission, the first all-civilian mission to low Earth orbit, when he gave away three seats, <laughs> which is incredibly generous, and raised more than $240 million for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Well, he's not done yet. As a matter of fact, he just announced three more missions for a new program called Polaris. So, let's see what he's up to. Jared, <laughs> congratulations. It uh, sounds like you're a bit addicted to space as you announced some exciting new uh, space missions today. Uh, give us a rundown here on what Polaris is. Uh, sure, and uh, great to finally connect. I don't think we've had a chance to do that throughout uh, the previous mission. So, um... Just at like press conferences quick. So yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to finally see you. Well, I appreciate, great. Your, appreciate your work. Um, but yeah, uh, so really, I mean, the last 18 months is, as you know, incredibly well, has been just such an exciting time in, in, you know, human and commercial space exploration. I mean, so much has been accomplished. And really what we're trying to do with the Polaris program is build on some of that momentum by embarking on a series of, you know, tech demonstration missions, building blocks, if you will, um, that will ultimately culminate in the first crewed launch of, of Starship. So the first mission, uh, Polaris Dawn, uh, which we went into a little bit more specifics today, uh, has a number of interesting objectives. So uh, we're uh, endeavoring to fly in the highest Earth orbit ever flown, uh, so surpassing the Gemini record, and, uh, and going uh, obviously farther into space since, since humans last walked on the moon. Now, uh, that's more than just you know, a record, as mentioned earlier. Uh, there's an awful lot we can learn getting you know, reasonably close to the Van Allen radiation belts. Um, you know, ideally develop countermeasures for future long duration space flights, especially when you start thinking that, you know, with Starship coming online, you know, Mars can be within our reach. Uh, the second objective is uh, we will do uh, a commercial EVA. Uh, so we're going to test out a new, um, a new generation suit that will be an evolution off of the, you know, sexy looking IVA suit that, that most people are familiar with that SpaceX develops. Um, and, uh, and the idea there is it's actually not just uh, suit design, but even the, uh, the kind of pre-breathe protocol that goes into it. So, um, you know, as, as you know, it's, uh, it's not quite like the movies where you just kind of clip your helmet on and run outside. Uh, it's actually yeah. quite a, a process in advance. But if, if you're going to have thousands, tens of thousands of people on the moon or Mars, um, you're probably not going to want to have a 24-hour type pre-breathe protocol, um, you know, if people are going out and working in space every day. So uh, there's two elements to that besides suit design, and, and we also think we'll be able to incorporate um, some other interesting tech demos, a component of the EBA, but th that's for later. Um, and then uh, the third objective is to test out uh, Starlink, um, you know, laser-based communication. So if we're going to have, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, low latency, high, you know, high bandwidth type communication coming off of the moon and Mars, you're going to need to do that with lasers. And even with all that, um, you know, you got to wait 15 minutes for each, each way um, at best. So uh, testing that out in low Earth orbit uh, to inform future evolutionary upgrades for the technology is pretty important. Um, we also like it because it, it coincides with our, our, our Earth cause that we're very passionate about too. Um, which is a continuation of, of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital fundraising awareness, but now we're looking at their global health initiative specifically. And their objective is to raise um, childhood cancer survival rates across the world. Um, and one way to do that, if you don't have a St. Jude Research Hospital in every single country, uh, is through telemedicine and satellite-based communication. Um, and then we, we've got five days on orbit, so uh, as you saw in the you know, press release, we've, we've partnered with a number of institutions um, uh, in order to round out, uh, you know, a pretty in, uh, intensive um, uh, research, um, you know, component to the mission. So, right. So that's so that's Polaris Dawn. That's the first of three. Is going to have all of these objectives, which are pretty substantial objectives. I mean, this is already taking a pretty big evolutionary jump over Inspiration Four already, which was in itself groundbreaking. But this is you're adding a lot of elements here to this one. Um, so what's, what's, what's in store for potentially Mission 2 and Mission 3 while we're kind of doing an over, overview here? I mean, Mission 3 will be the first crewed um, flight of Starship, so we know that. And, um, you know, while we have a lot of um, good things that we've, um, we've discussed, interesting ideas around Mission 2, um, a lot of it is going to be informed with what we learned from Polaris Dawn and also what, what SpaceX learns from uh, all the testing they're going to be doing in Starbase. Uh, so... You know, they do have a number of, uh, you know, uncrewed 
uh, flights. They'll be putting Starlinks up with Starships. They're going to put payload up for that. So the things that they can learn through, you know, uncrewed flights is great. And the ones that they think will, you know, there'll be more benefit if we were able to, to gather some data from a crewed mission will inevitably wind up on the, on the second Polaris mission. Yeah. So, uh, so let's jump again to the, back to the third one with Starship. It, uh, is it kind of to be determined yet, or are you potentially launching and landing on Starship, or are you going to potentially be meeting up with it in orbit? Do you have any idea on that yet? The third mission uh, will be a, a crewed uh, ascent, uh, low Earth orbit mission, and a reentry all on Starship. Um, really? Okay. So I, I didn't realize that. For some reason, I was thinking you were going to be uh, potentially docking using Falcon to, to Starship, but you're talking full blown. Launch to landing Starship mission, huh? And what a great idea, though. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the um, yeah the fir- the third mission will be a uh, uh, full cr- uh, full Starship mission from from launch all the way through uh, reentry and touchdown. That's awesome. Okay, so Polaris makes me think of North Star. Uh, are you thinking at all about having the second mission be some kind of polar orbit or highly inclined orbit that would actually go over the poles for the first time in human spaceflight? Is that at all a capability or any kind of thought? Um, I think that, um, well, first of all, I think that's very interesting, but, you know, we're, for sure, the second mission is going to be very focused on getting greater uh, comfort on the ultimate third mission, which is, you know, first crewed yeah. crew flight of Starship. So um, very much what we learned from Polaris Dawn and also what they learn in Starbase is what's going to inform that second mission. But I, I would expect it to, to be a mission designed to de-risk the third mission. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. That's that's still very exciting. Um, but it, uh, in, on that note of uh, testing things and things, you're you're talking obviously about Starlink being such an important aspect of the of the very first one, using uh, laser communication and all the new upgrades to Starlink. Um, is that going to be something as far as just even outreach on the mission? Are you hoping to be able to uh, include more live streaming with that new capability, with the increased bandwidth, having better connectivity? Is, uh, is that one way you're hoping to kind of you know bring this down to the average person and help raise awareness? Yeah, for, yes, for sure. I mean, I think that first communication is going to be um, you know really, and it should be really impactful, um, and and hopefully you know serve in a unifying way towards what we can what we can accomplish in space and also here on Earth. Um, but I mean, it has so much uh, of just an operational benefit to the mission. So you know, on Inspiration Four, we we only had comm coverage about eighty percent of the duration of the mission. I know there was a lot of critiques of why why we didn't have more live streams going uh, similar to NASA missions, and that's because you know the TDRS network is in, is, is a government asset, um, and we wouldn't be the same priority as maybe you know the space station or a NASA mission on that. Um, when you incorporate Starlink into it, um, it opens up uh, a lot more windows, uh, considerably more, uh, to provide. Um, you know, high resolution connectivity back to Earth. And I, and I do think that that imagery is actually, you know, fulfills what, what should be an important component to every human space mission, which is the inspirational nature of it. Absolutely. So I, I picture, you know, a really high quality, uh, you know, at least 1080, maybe 4K, you know, downlinking and, and getting some really good images of, of you guys floating around this time in the Dragon capsule. And I think, you know, that stuff does matter. Like you said, that's, that's a pretty key component to having, you know, bringing the people along with you for these missions as well. I agree um, completely. Yeah, and, and to that, uh, that kind of makes me think of, uh, speaking of bringing people along with you, I remember, uh, I believe your wife, Monica, when you got done with <laughs> Inspiration4, said something along the lines of, well, thank God that's done. Uh, how is she feeling about this new set of missions? <laughs> Has she has she kind of like gotten re excited about it or, or what's her how's she feeling? Yeah, the uh, the the ban on future space missions that was not actually my my wife. The uh, subtitle was incorrect on that. That was my mother and and my fortunately my, my, my wife's opinion matters way more. Um, and uh, we've been together for for so long. Um, she's seen me grow throughout my entire aviation career. Um, uh, I had, I have no doubt she knew that um, when we came back from Inspiration 4, it would likely not be the last mission. And she's incredibly supportive. My kids are charged up about it. They want me to bring back more aliens. So That's, that's incredible. Um, how would she feel if you, you, you know, obviously you're, you're a huge fan of space flight in general uh, and, and with everything that SpaceX is working on. Uh, what are your thoughts on Mars and what do you think her thoughts would be on you potentially going to Mars if that's something you wanted to do? Do you want to go to Mars? Yeah, so I think what would be, um, 
I think the best way, you know, the, the, first, the first Mars mission uh, mm-hmm. has, to be, has to be launched with an incredibly high confidence of success, um, including a return back to Earth. I think, you know, anyone who, who believes that, you know, it's totally okay to just send like a one-way mission and think it'll all work itself out is just totally not understanding what the objective is of, of making life multiplanetary. Um, so um, I'm quite sure that my wife, if, uh, if she knew that there was, a, again, very high confidence of success in a return, she'd be supportive of it. But there's a lot that needs to be accomplished before that, including getting the first, you know, crewed star- starship into low Earth orbit. Um, I'm really fortunate to be able to play a part in that objective. Yeah, so you, you obviously have, uh, have piloted Starship as well as many other vehicles. What is it like to actually, or not Starship, sorry, Dragon. Uh, what's, it, what's it like to actually pilot the Dragon capsule as far as a, just purely from a piloting experience uh, using the, the touch screen and things like that? Is it, is it intuitive? Is it, uh, yeah, what's it like to, to, to fly a spacecraft? Well, first of all, it has an incredible autopilot, um, thanks to a lot of brilliant people here at SpaceX. Um, you know, we, uh, throughout our training in the simulator, there was, you know, some sort of an uh, emergency going off every 30 seconds, you know, thanks to, thanks to Sarah. Um, so it's just this constant chaos to train for the worst. And then in reality, you get in the vehicle in space and you don't hear any of those alerts at all. And it, uh, and it, it works incredibly <laughs> well. I will say navigating all the touchscreens and such is super intuitive. Um, it's just like any modern glass cockpit in an aircraft. Um, but the fact that it works so well, I mean, just frees up everyone in the crew to, you know, rest easy and think about all the other objectives you're trying to accomplish while you're on orbit. Um, and I've no doubt they're going to take everything that they've learned that made Dragon such a successful, you know, vehicle to operate and bring it right over to Starship. Gotcha. So did you, I guess that brings up the question, did you actually pilot Dragon at all on orbit? Yeah, I guess what I, I guess what you know what what would be the definition of it all. So I mean, you know, typically, like, did you manually control Dragon at some point? Um, you manually put in a lot of inputs in, into Dragon, and you certainly did in the simulators. But I would say for like the entire on orbit time, Dragon did its thing incredibly well. Um, and most of what your training is is about contingencies if what it's supposed to do doesn't happen. So really, it's it's a testament again to the to the robustness and and how uh, smoothly operating the dragon is that it that it just does its job and that you don't have to be doing anything and that's kind of the point. Yeah, I mean, I would I would liken it very much to any of the you know business jets that I've flown with like thousands of hours. I mean, you're putting the autopilot on in cruise um, and it's taking you all the way there. In fact, I'm pretty much every you know modern commercial airliner will land right on the runway for you if it needs to. So there's tons of similarities there, but that doesn't mean that. You don't still go through, you know, your, your recurrent training every six months about, you know, the, the Apollo 13-like failures when everything stops working. Um, it just, that doesn't typically happen on, on mission. And it certainly didn't with Inspiration4. I don't expect it to on um, any, of the players, uh, any of the players' missions. But we'll be well prepared. And when you guys were planning, I remember seeing a little snippet. Uh, you know, obviously, you had brought up the idea of going higher than ever before, but, you know, Players Dawn will be taking that to... Uh, a, a lot higher orbit yet. You know, if you're going to be breaking, you know, the Gemini record, you're going to be over almost like 1,500 kilometers or something. You're going to be, you're going to be a ways up there. Is that going to be a circular 1,500 kilometer orbit or is it elliptical? Um, can you tell us how far you are in that mission planning pro- process? Yeah, I mean, we're, when we when we're saying um, breaking the you know the Gemini record, you're, you can assume you're in that you know well certainly above 1,360 kilometers, and um, I expect similar to the Gemini record, it will also be like a highly elliptical orbit. Um, but you know, worth pointing out, like it is this is really hard to do. Um, you know, as you as you know, um, I mean, the higher you go up, uh, obviously you, you've got even more energy to take out, and it and it, it obviously takes away some some various windows for when you could come home under you know less than ideal circumstances. So it does create a lot of you know good and interesting challenges here for the engineers at SpaceX because you're going to have to be thinking about those same things when you're when you're even farther out, when you're out at the moon, and and obviously in you know even even you know more ambitious long duration space missions that are surely to come. So it's a great opportunity to learn an awful lot, um, you know, whether it's informing vehicle design or software updates, um, you, know, con- you know, ways to come home with uh, certain contingencies, as well as all the research we're going to do on board, which will primarily be geared towards, you know, the radiation exposure, which also has vehicle implications. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I imagine in my head, I feel like an elliptical orbit would actually be a really, really cool experience uh, to be on board because you'll get a kind of changing view of the Earth. You know, you'll get that perspective from a little bit further away and... And then kind of zoom back in, you know, like that's a pretty substantial if you're going from low Earth orbit up to a little bit, you know, quite a bit higher, 1300 plus. I mean, that's a 
Substan people I remember on you know on Hubble when they the astronauts that that deployed Hubble and, and serviced Hubble would all mention how much substantially higher it felt to be at that orbit compared to you know ISS orbit and you experienced that as well on Inspiration Four is it is it a substantial difference I guess at, at even that end altitude difference it, it absolutely is I'm 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 tell you just as you said I'm incredibly excited to see what the, what this is going to look like. Um, there was a huge difference. So as you recall, I mean, with, with Inspiration4, you know, our, our peak apogee was about 590 kilometers. Um, we slowly brought ourselves, uh, phased, our, phased our way back down prior to reentry. And there's a huge difference between, you know, what you can see. Obviously, we also had the benefit of unbelievable window in the cupola at, you know, near 600 kilometers versus, you know, for example, the, the ISS uh, altitude. So, um, you know, based on what I understand our, our, our target orbit is going to look like, um, it's going to be a heck of a swing um, between peak apogee and perigee. Um, we'll try and capture some good imagery and, and send it home. Yeah. So uh, speaking of the cupola, too, you won't, that will not actually be on Polaris Dawn, correct? Because you'll need the, the, the actual hatch mechanism to be able to do the EVA. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that's a, probably a bit of a bummer, but the EVA will be, probably make it much worth it, I assume. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, for sure. Um, knowing you're going to be able to make uh, you know some contributions to what you know will ultimately drive future space exploration missions. I mean, that's that's why we want to that's why we want to be here and do this. So, yeah, well, it'll be okay not to have a, a window for the for this mission. On, on that, I have two more questions, quick, and then I'll then I'll let you get. I know you got a, a lot going on here today with all this stuff, but. Uh, those EVA suits, though, you mentioned that it's going to be kind of a variation of the IVA suit or some kind of evolution of it. Um, it sounds like in, in the typical SpaceX fashion, it kind of sounds like this is a, an evolutionary process, kind of do the next thing and, and iterate on that. So it, tell us as much as you know about what the suit will likely be. Yep, for sure. Well, first, all four of us will be wearing uh, exactly the same suit. And oh, okay. um, because uh, there's going to be like substantial enhancements to this um, from a mobility perspective, dexterity in the fingers, but also redundancies. Um, so keep in mind, you know, the current IVA suit is a, is a last line of defense in the case of um, either a fire or, um, you know, a full depress. Uh, mm -hmm. This will no longer be the last line. Like you have to build in, you know, <laughs> you you're, intentionally, on it. you're intentionally putting yourself in, in that environment. So you, you're going to want to have, um, the suit's going to have to have a, a lot of redundancies from what, what we flew previously on Inspiration4. So all four of us will have that. We do anticipate two crew members will conduct the EBA. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of training that's going to go into it. And then we're, we're also, we are looking at different things, whether it's a pay, from a payload or technology perspective to incorporate during the EVA. So all of that will ultimately inform, um, you know, who's getting out there. But for sure, I mean, all four of us, you know, there is no airlock, so it'll be vented down to, to vacuum. We have to be able to, you know, to be able to work, function, and perform um, under those circumstances. That's why all four need the same suit. And then the cabin will be repressed after EVA, or is it going to be something where... Uh, you do that right before re-entry, or it, I assume repressed, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, okay, just like Gemini. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then one last question here for you, and then I'll let, I'll let you get out of here. What are you most looking forward to in spaceflight? Besides, I, I, I'm going to give the caveat, you can't be looking forward to your own, your own incredible mission here. Besides that, what thing, as a spaceflight fan, because you are a huge spaceflight nerd, what thing are you looking forward to most in 2022? Well, there is... There is obviously a lot there. I mean, I think SpaceX has five Falcon Heavy launches this summer. Um, so I've never seen one in person. I am incredibly oh, charged up about that. Um, and then obviously, you know, Elon said, we're, Starship's gonna get, to, gonna get to orbit before the end of the year. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of, lot of testing that coincides with that or, or leads up to it. So um, I think, you know, between KSC and, um, and Starbase, uh, there's gonna be a lot of action, um, you know, trying to weigh it between, I mean, near term, for sure. I, I really want to see a Falcon Heavy launch. I think that's going to be incredible, but no doubt. I mean, and as you know already, just being in Starbase is, feels like a religious experience and what they're working on there um, can really change everything. So I'm excited to see that progress unfold this year too. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really, really, really hard to beat seeing the world's most powerful rocket ever fly. You know, that's going to be, that's going to be something incredible to see. So I hope, I hope you're going to be down here for that one at a, uh, when it does take off, I assume you, you will be. Planning on it. Do it. <laughs> and we'll hopefully see you then, too. So, 
Well, Jared, thank you so much for all your time and congratulations on Polaris. We're really, really excited to see how this thing continues to evolve and continues to inspire. And uh, let us know if there's anything we can do here to, to help raise awareness. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Tim. Thanks for the support. And uh, yeah, let's chat a bunch as this all unfolds. Sounds great. All right, thanks, Jared. Thanks, take care. Thank you so much to Jared and your team for allowing me so much time to pick your brain on some stuff. I hope in the future we can just really sit down and nerd out over just some good old space flight stuff because Jared knows his stuff. Be sure and stick around because I've got a lot more fun, exciting things coming out here in the next few days. And we're still working on a lot of other things behind the scenes, including we're kind of continuing with some of those more uh, basic concept ideas, like why don't rocket engines melt? How do you power a rocket engine? So we're working on a cycle types video as we speak. That's going to be amazing. And we'll do things like how do you start a rocket engine and what are orbits and all these different things. So be sure you stick around because there's a lot more exciting stuff coming. I will a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make videos like this and everything else we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you want to help me continue to do what I do and gain access to some exclusive fun things, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our awesome merchandise such as this one, the RD-171 t-shirt. Super cool, along with things like our future Martian shirt or the rest of our schematics collection or lots of other fun stuff. You can find it over at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.